five milliseconds at 1080p on a 13 teraflop machine for cloud shading only half the frame surface area. For my layman viewers, there's a massive FPS difference when clouds are disabled inside the overhyped, under-criticized, and supposedly faster Unreal 5.5. This basic effect is now running over 800% slower than it was in Unreal Engine 5.4 and still relies on temporal smear abuse to hide jittering. This isn't some, oh, it's just gonna be patched out scenario. I told Epic Games during the preview phase of 5.5 about this issue so they could fix it before they release the production ready version of 5.5. No one is talking about issues like this. And if I can show you something this broken in 30 seconds, imagine what I'll show you in the rest of this video. In this video, I'm gonna set some new standards for both gamers and non-graphic developers on what ninth generation hardware can and should be delivering. First, I'll break down a logical approach to modern frame budgets to maximize the under-discussed limitations of modern consoles. Then we'll explore the declining quality and indirect lighting solutions and disprove the ridiculous arguments made in defense of the performance and quality regression seen in modern titles. Before diving into the technical breakdowns, it's very important to clarify the scenario that drives the studio's technological focus. We are developing a fast-paced, realistic third-person action title. The gameplay alternates between outdoor and indoor environments, with roughly 75% of the scene composed of static objects. The remaining 25% consist of dynamic elements including characters, breakable objects, vehicles, moving light occluders, such as doors and windows, and finally, moving and toggable light sources. It's very important for viewers to note that the conditions mirror the scenarios found in hundreds of games, including many produced on 9th gen. This means the improvements and systems we advocate for, and with your support we may eventually produce, can benefit hundreds of third-party productions in terms of quality and performance. The target hardware for this studio, and what the industry should prioritize as well, is going to be the PS5 and Series X consoles because of their well-established enhancements over their base gen and mid gen predecessors. The plan we promote today accounts for the limitations between these machines, such as the lower theoretical teraflop power of the base PS5 and the Series X two times slower SSD speed. This allows for extra benefits when performance and image quality goals have been met universally between the two. So if you're out there with your 4070 talking about how great the features we criticize run on your hardware, you are incredibly irrelevant to this conversation because you are in fact way beyond target spec. The Series S remains as a destructive outlier due to completely botching the established hardware improvements from its mid-gen predecessor. And for this reason, we cannot scrutinize the butchered image quality or extreme upscaling we've seen on this console. Since there doesn't seem to be enforced image quality standards, we believe the Series S should not dictate or limit the progress of visual standards for the truly hardware-enhanced machines. Now, let's discuss the appropriate target resolution and frame rate because I find the performance or resolution mode trend to be a very poor approach to modern hardware utilization. Consider the PS5 and PS4. On PS4, most 8th generation visuals ran at 1080p, 30fps on a 1.9 teraflop system. To double the frame rate, twice the amount of power is needed which fits comfortably in the PS5 hardware budget, leaving large headroom for the much needed 9th generation visual improvements. But resolution is a far more demanding challenge. Moving from 1080p to 4K requires four times the computational power, which consumes over half the available hardware resources, just to maintain the flawed appearance and limited complexity of 8th generation console visuals, and again at only 30 FPS, which does not promote defined substantial improvement. But this compromise is completely unnecessary when you take into a whole new perspective on the situation. 60 FPS establishes a clear improvement from last gen without running up the hardware budget. But what about resolution? From a financial perspective and a higher win ratio for consumers, we need to focus on the 4K and 1080p market. Instead of raising the resolution which multiplies the cost of 60 FPS outside of hardware capabilities and tightly constrains the budget of enhanced visual techniques, the industry should focus on raising image quality via better anti-aliasing. This isn't a super original stance, but I'm gonna bring a lot more context to the argument. I'm also saying we don't need AI or hardware upgrades to achieve this. Many 9th gen titles are being rendered below 1080p, so sticking to this resolution already logically improves quality here. 4K TVs can rely on integer scaling from a 1080p output in the worst case scenario, but 4K upscaling from 1080p could be a lot more simple and in turn a lot cleaner than the current approaches, but it's a big topic for an upcoming video. Now let's dive into global illumination, and we're talking a much closer look into the subject than the most popular video covering the topic. First, let's discuss why light maps are not viable for our use case. First, there is developer resistance. 
there's the time-consuming baking processes, which doesn't mix well with modern development culture that caters to lazier and cheaper developments. We refer to this as checkmark culture. Many developers have also established light maps and large open worlds face significant memory challenges. Lastly, light maps don't mix well with destructible light sources or dynamic occluders. But so many people push this idea that the only alternative to light maps is bland ambient lighting with maybe some DFAO or a super dynamic expensive GI method when many 8th generation titles shift with alternative solutions much more lightweight and in some ways higher quality than what use case titles are using today. Before I go any further, I want to dismiss the inevitable comments on the highly unrelated issue where dynamic objects pop out from their baked environments. This poor looking phenomenon is usually implemented on purpose, usually in competitive games where player sight or perspective advantages are unwanted by the developers. But the systems I'll be mentioning today should not introduce this effect since both static and dynamic objects should be shaded in the same pass. Quantum Break, MGSV, and I'm pretty sure Detroit Human all utilize probe-based lighting in combination with screen space GI AO and or combined with an ambient lighting fallback. Unity has a probe-based lighting only system as well that even records or really pre-computes the visibility of moving skylights. But a lot of people will argue against these volumetric based approaches with concerns about leaking or wall thickness limitations. This sets up the conversation for three different topics. Most people are unfortunately only familiar with overly simple ambient occlusion implementations that cause halo artifacts around objects like characters. This has long been an issue with UE4 and to this day even UE5's SSAO. But you can go back almost nine years ago to MGSV, where its SSAO originally suffers from the same problems but allows for driver-forced HBO+. A closed source technique, but often butchered, largely solves this halo problem at a dirt cheap price. Another issue you'll find with most AO is their lack of lighting awareness. For instance, anything in direct light should not have AO applied if you compare to path tracing. This can be implemented as seen with this open source mobile compatible GTAO. Another issue with a lot of AO solutions is noise, and we've seen plenty of non-TAA reliant examples but I want to quickly mention MXAO, which purposely doesn't use random sampling patterns because those require more expensive denoisements. Instead, it uses Bayer dithering because it's easier and cheaper to smooth. Retro games also use Bayer for smoothing, but in an analog sense. In other words, taking advantage of the easy smoothing properties offered in Bayer extend outside of SSAO. I could cover a lot more regarding the AO situation, but I'll go ahead and move on with a memory concern on probes. A smarter approach for this issue is to bake probe density near static surfaces while keeping it more sparse in open areas, maybe introducing newer probes around dynamic objects. Leak prevention has been discussed in Detroit Human documents, and my personal favorite is from a GI SIG representation from 2021 using a low resolution depth map function. Now that I've covered these popular graphic concerns, you're now ready for my addressment of the pros and cons of the technology saturating modern graphic conversations. Then I'll discuss some of the forgotten gems of GI rendering to enrich consumer knowledge of existing graphic techniques and revive consumer awareness on optimized performance in this modern age of hardware abuse. Now let's talk about DDGI, which ray traces the environment's lighting in sparse amounts that are end up being encoded into irradiance probes that light the environment with zero noise. It approaches leaking via adaptive probe relocation. DDGI can't provide ambient occlusion though. To see what I mean, take a look at the path trace reference, then DDGI with conservative radius RTAO, and then DDGI with the UE4's SAO. And like I said, we need better SSAO, but material AO is an important piece of the look that should be pre-computed for consumers, which is why it's so important to fix the baked material AO workflows inside Unreal, since they're far from being a checkmark workflow. But DDGI also lacks indirect shadows present in path tracing, sfogi, lumen, and even baked lighting inside Unreal, provided via distance fields, a very cheap and great looking effect for non-skeletal meshes. It's just that distance fields have to reside in VRAM, and although seemingly small to store, Unreal does a very bad job at optimizing the resolution on a per object basis. The last thing DDGI lacks is rough specular or radiance. You can see this difference in path tracing and lumen versus DDGI but this might just call instead for small-scale specular representation, as seen with Quantum Break, or probably a better example would be the Order's 1886 use of spherical Gaussians to get that very important directionality appearance of the lighting. Now that I've defined LumenGI's superior aspects over DDGI, 
Now it's time to go over its major issues such as the cost, which can usually hang around 3.8 milliseconds in a large city environment on a desktop 3060. And remember, this is only the cost for Lumen GI since Lumen Reflections introduced their own separate cost for any material below a certain roughness value. I'm giving Lumen GI the best possible timing here since I slowed down its update rates significantly from its default configurations in combination with using its faster software ray tracing version. But despite being on its fifth iteration, none of the major issues everyone is talking about has been fixed, such as the disocclusion errors, the splotchy inconsistencies, noise, and smearing. Which is especially bad when you have a character with a camera-based turn animation where light can smear on the character's face. A scenario conveniently not replicatable in Fortnite. Lumen's normal base temporal rejection either scales on the ineffective side or refuses to account for basic two-position subpixel jitter. And the importance of that issue will eventually be covered in our anti-aliasing technology video. It's now time to present some very optimized and criminally under-discussed indirect lighting techniques so we can continue getting the record straight. MGSV interpolates multiple sets of spherical harmonics containing times of day, weather cycles, and lighting scenarios. To save cost, it shades diffuse indirect lighting on a texture half the size of the main resolution. Then, bilaterally upscales it by comparing the half resolution depth texture with the full resolution depth texture so that all geometric lines are evenly and efficiently lit. But let's get more advanced though. The division is another similar scenario with a mostly static environment with dynamic lights. The GI approach in the division uses probes that store cube maps of the normal and albedo scene. The probe's visibility to each other is pre-computed and listed in memory. And of course, some other complex concepts are applied, but we end up with a solution that creates bounce light per frame as lights are casted on objects. Short-term, non-screen space bound GI in an open world, all done on base 8th gen consoles. This is so much more impressive than the splotchy mess we have with Lumen in large scale scenes. Let's talk about another lighting approach seen on PS4, such as shadow map occlusion tracing in Ghost of Tsushima. The devs use G-Buffer cube maps similar to the Division and then trace the sunlight's shadow map to prevent specular leaking inside interiors. This technique is apparently a little crude, but I've never seen this exploited for a global illumination technique in terms of occlusion, etc. And it's something we need to start considering when we erase shadow maps with ray trace shadows that don't provide that depth information. Now our last mention for GI is going to be Radiance Cascades, which is not an 8th gen technique but it was designed under a scenario where abusable and competent TAA could not be used and the graphics programmer behind it wasn't a fan of the undocumented slow resolve timings not found in dynamic GI papers. Now Radiance Cascades comes from the screen space GI that introduces a optimized ray sampling method, where a fixed cost I've heard is possibly maintainable. Basically you have a dense layer probe sampling a few directions in a very limited range. Then another layer of probes less dense than before sample further information at a higher directional capacity. A few more layers, or cascades, continue that pattern. It's a concept that optimizes the spatial relevance of rays so that each layer can be interpolated for a coherent enough representation to generate realistic bounce light and shadowing. You'll usually find this technique done in 2D, but there's already moving development in the 3D space and now recently a very fast non-screen space implementation just saw the light of day. When you look at these techniques from a broader perspective, I really hope viewers can see the potential each technique brings for a specific problem. I want to see more exploration in these approaches from graphic engineers, especially in Unreal. When you have an industry standard engine that is founded on temporal smear abuse and sustained by Fortnite, a game where expensive dynamic GI is actually justified because the environment is not static, but completely dynamic, we get games like Stalker 2 where the environment is static but ends up performing and looking worse than it should in consumer hands. Unfortunately, these legitimate problems will not be fixed or focused on by mainstream industry because there is no market incentive. Despite what I and many others consider peak abuse in performance and image quality standards, standout games will continue to thrive regardless as long as the majority of consumers excuse modern issues due to not knowing what's possible in graphics optimization or simply having zero hope in future improvement. Threat Interactive is that hope, and your subscription to the channel is pivotal in the success of our mission. So if you haven't, subscribe right now if you care about modern image quality and basic performance standards, because that will push our content to the majority of consumers. This is your opportunity to establish a market that is being taken advantage of and validated and ignored. And if it interests you, Binge our information-packed content starting with our first video on fake optimization.